Mary Wollstonecraft from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia, at en.wikipedia.org. Mary Wollstonecraft, born April 27, 1759, died September 10, 1797, was a British writer, philosopher, and early feminist. During her brief career, she wrote novels, treatises, a travel narrative, a history of the French Revolution, a conduct book, and a children's book. Wollstonecraft was best known for a vindication of the rights of woman, in which she argued that women are not naturally inferior to men, but only appeared to be because they lacked education. She suggested that both men and women should be treated as rational beings and imagined a social order founded on reason. Among both the general public and feminists, Wollstonecraft's life has often received as much, if not more, interest than her writing because of her unconventional and often tumultuous personal relationships. After two unsuccessful affairs with Henry Fusilli and Gilbert Imlay, Wollstonecraft married the philosopher William Godwin, one of the forefathers of the anarchist movement. She was also the mother of Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein. Wollstonecraft died at the age of 38 due to complications from childbirth, leaving behind several unfinished manuscripts. T today, Wollstonecraft is considered a foundational thinker in feminist philosophy. Her early advocacy of women's equality and her attacks on conventional femininity and the degradation of women presaged the later emergence of the feminist movement. Feminist scholars and activists have cited both her philosophical ideas and personal struggles as important influences in their work. Section 1. Early Life Wollstonecraft was born on April 27, 1759, in Spitalfields, London. Although her family had a comfortable income when she was a child, her father gradually squandered on speculative projects. Consequently, the family became financially unstable and they were frequently forced to move during Wollstonecraft's youth. The family's financial situation eventually became so dire that Wollstonecraft's father compelled her to turn over money that she would have inherited at her maturity. Moreover, he was apparently a violent man who had beat his wife in drunken rages. As a teenager, Wollstonecraft used to lie outside the door of her mother's bedroom to protect her. Wollstonecraft played a similar maternal role for her sisters, Everina and Eliza, throughout her life. For example, in a defining moment in 1784, she convinced her sister Eliza, who was suffering from what was probably postpartum depression, depression associated with childbirth, to leave her husband an infant. Wollstonecraft made all of the arrangements for Eliza to flee, demonstrating her willingness to challenge social norms. The human costs, however, were severe. Her sister suffered social condemnation and, because she could not remarry, was doomed to a life of poverty and hard work. Two friendships shaped Wollstonecraft's early life. The first was with Jane Arden of Beverly. The two frequently read books together and attended lectures presented by Arden's father, a self-styled philosopher and scientist. Wollstonecraft reveled in the intellectual atmosphere of the Arden household and valued her friendship with Arden greatly, sometimes to the point of being emotionally possessive. Wollstonecraft wrote to her, I haven't formed romantic notions of friendship. I am a little singular in my thoughts of love and friendship. I must have the first place or none. In some of Wollstonecraft's letters to Arden, she reveals the volatile and particularly depressive emotions that would haunt her throughout her life. The second and more important friendship was with Fanny Blood, whom Wollstonecraft credited with opening her mind. Wollstonecraft envisioned living in a female utopia with Blood. They made plans to rent rooms together and support each other emotionally and financially, but this dream collapsed under economic realities. Moreover, Wollstonecraft eventually realized that she had idolized blood. She was more invested in traditional family values than was Wollstonecraft. But Wollstonecraft remained dedicated to her and her family throughout her life. She frequently gave pecuniary assistance to blood's brother, for example. In order to make a living, Wollstonecraft, her sisters, and blood set up a school together in Newington Green, a dissenting community, but blood soon became engaged. After her marriage, her husband, Hugh Skees, took her to Europe to improve her health, which had always been precarious. After she became pregnant, though, Blood's health deteriorated even further. In 1785, Wollstonecraft followed Blood to nurse her, but to no avail. Moreover, her abandonment of the school led to its failure. Blood's death devastated Wollstonecraft and was part of the inspiration for her first novel, Mary. Section 2. The First of a New Genus After Blood's death, 
Wollstonecraft returned to Britain, where she obtained a position as a governess for the respectable Kingsborough family in Ireland. Although she could not get along with Lady Kingsborough, the children found her an inspiring instructor. Margaret King would later say that she had freed her mind from all superstitions. Some of Wollstonecraft's experiences during this year would make their way to her only children's book, Original Stories from Real Life. Frustrated by the limited career options open to respectable yet poor women, an impediment which Wollstonecraft eloquently describes in the chapter of Thoughts on the Education of Daughters, entitled Unfortunate Situation of Females, Fashionably Educated and Left Without a Fortune. She decided, after only a year as a governess, to embark upon a career as an author. This was a radical decision, since, at the time, few women could support themselves by writing. As she wrote to her sister Everina in 1787, she was trying to become the first of a new genus. She moved to London and, assisted by the liberal publisher Joseph Johnson, found a place to live and work to support herself. She learned French and German and translated texts, most notably of The Importance of Religious Opinions by Jock Necker and Elements of Morality for the Use of Children by Christian Gunhoff Salzman. She also wrote reviews, mostly of novels, for Johnson's Analytical Review. Wollstonecraft's intellectual universe expanded during this time, not only from the reading that she did for her reviews, but also from the company she kept. She attended Johnson's famous dinners and met such luminaries as Thomas Paine and William Godwin. While in London, Wollstonecraft pursued a relationship with the artist Henry Fusilli, even though he was already married. She was, she wrote, enraptured by his genius, the grandeur of his soul, the quickness of comprehension, and lovely sympathy. She proposed a platonic living arrangement with Fuseli and his wife, but Fuseli's wife was appalled, and he broke off the relationship with Wollstonecraft. After Fuseli's rejection, Wollstonecraft decided to travel to France to escape the humiliation of the incident, and to participate in the revolutionary events that she had just celebrated in her recent Vindication of the Rights of Men. She wrote Vindication of the Rights of Men in response to Edmund Burke's conservative critique of the French Revolution and reflections on the revolution in France. She pursued these ideas, more indirectly, in A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, her most famous and influential work. Section 3. France and Gilbert Imlay Wollstonecraft left for Paris in December of 1792 and arrived about a month before Louis XVI was guillotined. The country was in turmoil. She sought out other English visitors such as Helen Maria Williams and joined the circle of expatriates then in the city. Having just written A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, Wollstonecraft was determined to put her ideas to the test, and in the stimulating intellectual atmosphere of the French Revolution, she attempted her most experimental romantic attachment yet. She met and fell passionately in love with Gilbert Imlay, an American adventurer. Whether or not Wollstonecraft was interested in marriage, Imlay was not, and Wollstonecraft appears to have fallen in love with an idealized portrait of the man. While Wollstonecraft had rejected the sexual component of relationships in A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, Imlay awakened her passions and her interest in sex. Wollstonecraft soon became pregnant, and on May 14, 1794, she gave birth to her first child, Fanny, naming her after perhaps her closest friend. Despite all of the upheavals surrounding her, Wollstonecraft never ceased writing. While in France, she gathered information for her version of a history of the early revolution and wrote avidly at La Havre. In December of 1794, an historical and moral view of the French Revolution was published in London. As the political situation worsened, England declared war on France, placing all English citizens in France in considerable danger. To protect Wollstonecraft, Imlay registered her as his wife in 1793, even though they were not married. Some of Wollstonecraft's friends were not so lucky. Many, like Thomas Paine, were arrested, and some were even guillotined. After Wollstonecraft left France, she continued to refer to herself as Mrs. Imlay, even to her sisters, in order to bestow legitimacy upon her child. Imlay, unhappy with the domesticated and maternal Wollstonecraft, eventually left her. He promised that he would return to La Havre, France, where she went to give birth to her child, but his delays in writing to her and his long absences convinced Wollstonecraft that he had found another woman. Her letters to him are full of needy expostulations, 
explained by most critics as the expressions of a deeply depressed woman, but by some as a result of her circumstances, alone with an infant in the middle of a revolution. Section 4. England and William Godwin. Seeking Imlay, Wollstonecraft in, in April of 1795, but he rejected her. In May of 1795, she attempted to commit suicide, probably with laudanum, but Imlay saved her life, although it was unclear how. In a last attempt to win back Imlay, she embarked upon some business negotiations for him in Scandinavia, trying to recoup some of his losses. Wollstonecraft undertook this hazardous trip with only her young daughter and a maid. She recounted her travels and thoughts in letters to Imlay, many of which were eventually published as letters written during a short residence in Sweden, Norway, and Denmark in 1796. When she returned to England and came to the full realization that her relationship with Imlay was over, she attempted suicide for the second time. She went out on a rainy night and, to make her clothes heavy with water, she walked up and down about half an hour before jumping into the Thames. But a stranger saw her and rescued her. Wollstonecraft considered her suicide deeply rational, writing after her rescue, I have only to lament that, when the bitterness of death was past, I was inhumanely brought back to life in misery, but a fixed determination is not to be baffled by disappointment, nor will I allow that to be a frantic attempt, which was one of the calmest acts of reason. In this respect, I am only accountable to myself. Did I care for what is termed reputation? It is by other circumstances that I should be dishonored. Slowly, well, Wollstonecraft returned to her literary life, becoming involved with Joseph Johnson's circle again, in particular with Mary Hayes, Elizabeth Inchbald, and Sarah Siddons through William Godwin. Godwin and Wollstonecraft's unique courtship began slowly, but it eventually became a passionate love affair. Godwin had read her letters written in Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, and later wrote that, if ever there was a book calculated to make a man in love with its author, this appears to me to be the book. She speaks of her sorrows in a way that fills us with melancholy and dissolves us in tenderness, at the same time that she displays a genius which commands all our admiration. Once Wollstonecraft became pregnant, they decided to marry so that their child would be legitimate. Their marriage revealed the fact that Wollstonecraft had never been married to Imlay, and as a result she and Godwin lost many friends. Godwin received further criticism because he had advocated for the abolition of marriage in his philosophical treatise, An Enquiry Concerning Political Justice. After their marriage on March 29, 1797, they moved into two adjoining houses, known as the Polygon, so that they could both still retain their independence, they often communicated by letter. By all accounts, theirs was a happy and stable, though tragically brief, relationship. Section 5. Death and Godwin's Memoirs On August 30, 1797, Wollstonecraft gave birth to her second daughter, Mary. Although the delivery seemed to go well initially, the placenta broke apart during the birth and became infected, a common occurrence in the 18th century. After several days of agony, Wollstonecraft died of septicemia on September 10th. Godwin was devastated. He wrote to his friend Thomas Holcroft, I firmly believe there does not exist her equal in the world. I know from experience we were formed to make each other happy. I have not the least expectation that I can now ever know happiness again. She was buried at Old St. Pancras Churchyard, and a memorial to her was constructed there, though both her and Godwin's remains were later moved to Bournemouth. Her tombstone reads, Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin, author of A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, born 27 April 1759, died 10 September 1797. In January of 1798, Godwin published his Memoirs of the Author of A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. Although Godwin felt that he was portraying his wife with love, compassion, and sincerity, many readers were shocked that he would reveal Wollstonecraft's illegitimate children, love affairs, and suicide attempts. Robert Southey accused him of the want of all feeling in stripping his dead wife naked. Godwin's memoirs portrays Wollstonecraft as a woman deeply invested in feeling, who is balanced by his reason and as even more of a religious skeptic than her own writings suggest. Section 6. Legacy. Wollstonecraft has had what Cora Kaplan calls a curious legacy. For an author-activist adept in many genres, up until the last quarter century Wollstonecraft's life has been read much more closely than her writing. 
After the devastating effect of Godwin's memoirs, Wollstonecraft's reputation lay in tatters for a century. She was even pilloried by such writers as Maria Edgeworth, who clearly patterned the freakish Harriet Freak in Belinda after Wollstonecraft. It was not until the late nineteenth century that Wollstonecraft was again applauded. With the advent of the feminist movement, women as politically dissimilar from each other as Virginia Woolf and Emma Goldman embraced Wollstonecraft's life story and celebrated her experiment in living, as Woolf termed them in a famous essay. Many, however, continued to decry Wollstonecraft's lifestyle. With the advent of feminist criticism in academia in the 1960s and 1970s, Wollstonecraft's works returned to prominence. Their fortunes reflected that of the feminist movement itself. For example, in the early 1970s, six major biographies of Wollstonecraft were published that presented her passionate life in opposition to her radical and rationalist agenda. Wollstonecraft was seen as a paradoxical yet intriguing figure who did not adhere to the 1970s version of feminism. The personal is the political. In the 1980s and 1990s, yet another image of Wollstonecraft emerged, one which described her as much more a creature of her time. Scholars such as Claudia Johnson, Gary Kelly, and Virginia Sapiro demonstrated the con continuity between Wollstonecraft's thought and other important 18th century ideas such as sensibility, economics, and political theory. Section 7. Major Works. Section 7.1. Thoughts on the Education of Daughters, published 1787, and Original Stories, published 1788. Wollstonecraft's first two works revolved around education. The first, Thoughts on the Education of Daughters, was a conduct book. That is, it was a text that gave advice not only on moral issues such as benevolence, but also on issues of etiquette such as dress. Such texts were extremely popular throughout the 18th century, particularly amongst the emerging middle class, who saw in them a way to develop a middle class ethos that would challenge the aristocratic code of manners. While much of what Wollstonecraft wrote in this text is platitudinous, there are moments, such as her description of the suffering single woman, that suggest she was not content to simply imitate other authors. One year later, in Original Stories from Real Life, Wollstonecraft wrote another educational text, this one for children. In it, two young girls, Mary and Carolyn, named after two of Lady Kinsborough's daughters, are instructed by a wise and benevolent maternal figure, Mrs. Mason. Throughout original stories, Wollstonecraft emphasizes the importance of rational thought in female education, a theme that would become a hallmark throughout her works. The girls are encouraged to feel sympathy for animals and for the poor, but they are specifically warned not to let their emotions run away with them. It is this balance between reason and passion that allows them to become charitable adults. The book went through nine editions before eventually going out of print in 1818. The second edition, printed in 1791, carried engravings by William Blake. Section 7.2 Vindication of the Rights of Men Published 1790 In 1790, Edmund Burke published Reflections on the Revolution in France. Burke, who had been a supporter of the American Revolution, shocked his contemporaries by arguing against the French revolutionaries. His book set off what is now known as the Revolution Controversy, a pamphlet war responding to Burke's text. Wollstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Men was the first of many sallies in a war that included other seminal works such as Thomas Paine's Rights of Man. But Wollstonecraft was not just responding to Burke's reflections. She was also responding to his A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and Beautiful, in which he argued that the beautiful was associated with weakness and femininity, and that the sublime was associated with strength and masculinity. Wollstonecraft turns Burke's rhetoric in the reflections against him. She argues that his theatrical staging, such as the famous scene in which he describes in florid prose the horrors Marie Antoinette had to undergo, turns Burke's readers, the citizens, into weak women who are swayed by show. She further critiques Burke's argument by focusing on class, demonstrating, like many other critics of Burke, that he was moved by Marie Antoinette's suffering but not by the plight of poor, starving women in France. Wollstonecraft also challenges Burke's argument that tradition should underlie political theory. She argues for rationality, pointing out that Burke's system would logically lead to the continuation of slavery simply because it had been an ancestral tradition. Wollstonecraft does not reject the need for sympathy in human relations that Burke emphasizes, 
but she often argues that sympathy is insufficient for social cohesion, at one point writing, Such misery demands more than tears. I pause to recollect myself. One must always also analyze any situation rationally. Significantly, she ends the vindication of the rights of men with a reference to the Bible. He fears God and loves his fellow creatures. Behold the whole duty of man. Section 7.3 Vindication of the Rights of Woman Published 1792 A vindication of the rights of woman is a hybrid of genres, a political treatise, a conduct book, and an educational treatise. In order to discuss the position of women in society, Wollstonecraft outlines the connections between four terms, rights, reason, virtue, and duty. Rights and duties are integrally linked for Wollstonecraft. If one has civic rights, then one also has civic duties. As she succinctly states, without rights there cannot be any incumbent duties. One of Wollstonecraft's main arguments in Vindication of the Rights of Woman is that women should be educated rationally so that they can contribute to society. Wollstonecraft responds vitriolically to such conduct book writers as James Fordyce and John Gregory and such educational philosophers as Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who argue that a woman does not need a rational education. By contrast, Wollstonecraft maintains that wives should be rational companions of their husbands. She points out that if society decides to leave the education of its children to women, those women must be well educated in order to pass on knowledge to the next generation. Wollstonecraft states that women are silly and superficial. She refers to them, for example, as spaniels and toys at one point, but says this is not because of an innate deficiency of mind, but because men have denied them access to education. Wollstonecraft is most intent on illustrating the limitations that women's educations have placed on them. Poetically, she writes, Taught from their infancy that beauty is woman's scepter, the mind shapes itself to the body, and, roaming around its gilt cage, only seeks to adorn its prison. The implication of the statement is that, without the damaging ideology encouraging young women from an early age to focus their attention on beauty and outward accomplishments, women could achieve more. It is debatable to what extent Wollstonecraft believed that women were equal to men. Certainly she was not a feminist in the modern sense of the word, since she called for neither equal rights nor suffrage in her texts. She does claim that all men and women are equal in the eyes of God, and that they are all subject to the same moral laws. However, such claims of equality stand in contrast to her statements respecting the superiority of masculine strength and valor. Wollstonecraft famously and ambiguously states, Let it not be concluded that I wish to invert the order of things. I have already granted that, from the constitution of their bodies, men seem to be designed by providence to attain a greater degree of virtue. I speak collectively of the whole sex but I see not the shadow of a reason to conclude that their virtues should differ in respect to their nature. In fact, how can they, if virtue has only one eternal standard? I must therefore, if I reason consequentially, as strenuously maintain that they have the same simple direction as that there is a God. One of Wollstonecraft's most scathing criticisms in Vindication of the Rights of Woman is against false and excessive sensibility, particularly in women. She argues that women who succumb to sensibility are blown about by every momentary gust of feeling, and because they are the prey of their senses, they cannot think rationally. In fact, she claims, they do harm not only to themselves but to the entire civilization. These are not women who can help refine a civilization, a popular 18th century idea, but women who will destroy it. Wollstonecraft does not argue that reason and feeling should act independently of each other. Rather, she believes that they should inform each other. In addition to her larger philosophical arguments, Wollstonecraft also lays out a specific educational plan. In Chapter 12, on National Education, she argues that all children should be sent to a country day school, as well as given some education at home, to inspire a love of home and domestic pleasures. She also maintains that schooling should be co-educational, arguing that men and women, whose marriages are the cement of society, should be educated after the same model. Wollstonecraft addressed her text to the middle class, which she called the most natural state, and in many ways vindication of the rights of woman is inflected by a bourgeois view of the world. She encourages modesty and industry and attacks the wealthy using the same language with which she accuses women of worthlessness. But she is not necessarily a friend of the poor, for example, in her national plan for education, 
she suggests that, after the age of nine, the poor be separated from the rich and taught in another school. Section 7.4 Mary, published 1788, and Maria, published 1798 Both of Wollstonecraft's novels focus on the sometimes desperate plight of women during the 18th century. In her first novel, Mary, a fiction, the eponymous protagonist, initially ignored as a child, suddenly becomes an heiress. She is consequently married off by her family as part of a property deal to a man she does not even know. Mary's husband, Charles, quickly disappears from the novel, and the bulk of the story focuses on the friendship between Mary and her sickly friend, Anne. They travel to the continent together in hopes of improving Anne's health, but to no avail. She dies. While there, Mary meets and falls in love with Henry. After Anne dies, Mary and Henry return to England. Henry is also ill, but Mary chooses to live with him and his mother during his last remaining weeks. Mary never recovers from the losses of Anne and Henry, and when her husband returns at the end of the book, she cannot bear to be in the same room with him. The end of the novel suggests that she will die young. Like Maria, this book is a comment on marriage. There are no successful marriages in the novel, and at the end, as she is dying, Mary thought she was hastening to that world where there is neither marrying nor giving in marriage, presumably a positive state of affairs. The only successful relationships in this book are friendships, and even those end tragically for Mary. Maria is an unfinished novel and often considered Wollstonecraft's most radical work. In it she details many of the wrongs of woman, not only on an individual level but on a systemic level as well. The protagonist, Maria, is imprisoned in an asylum by her profligate husband in order to steal her money. Sadly, her child is stolen from her as well. While in the asylum, Maria meets and perhaps falls in love with a man named Darnford, but because the novel is unfinished, it is unclear whether Wollstonecraft intended to resolve the romantic subplot happily or to end the novel tragically. Maria also befriends one of the nurses, Jemima, who, like Maria herself, has a harrowing tale to tell of married life. Jemima's tale gives Wollstonecraft an opportunity to show the bonds between women of different classes. Significantly, this is one of the first moments in the history of feminism that hints at a cross-class argument, that is, that women of different economic positions have the same interests because they are women. Deeply affected by her own romantic attachments and experiences in France, Wollstonecraft altered some of her previous opinions regarding class. She would not have made these same arguments six years earlier when she described the middle class as the natural state. Section 7.5 Letters Written in Sweden, Norway, and Denmark Published 1796 Wollstonecraft's Letters Written in Sweden is a travel narrative, but a very personal one. It consists not only of her reflections on Scandinavia and its peoples, but also on her relationship with Imlay, although he is not referred to by name. In this, her last major finished published work, Wollstonecraft was strongly influenced by the themes of Rousseau's Reveries of a Solitary Walker, the search for the source of human happiness, the stoic rejection of material goods, the ecstatic embrace of nature, and the essential role of sentiment in understanding. While Rousseau ultimately rejects society, Wollstonecraft celebrates domestic scenes and industrial progress in her text. Wollstonecraft also explores the connections between the sublime and sensibility. Many of the letters describe the breathtaking scenery of Scandinavia and Wollstonecraft's desire to create an emotional connection to that natural world. In so doing, she gives greater value to the imagination than she had in previous works. She contrasts this imaginative connection to the world with a commercial and mercenary one, an attitude that she associates with Imlay, and which she criticizes throughout the text. Section 8. List of Works Not included in this reading. Section 9. Notes Not included in this reading. Section 10. Bibliography Not included in this reading. Section 11. External Links not included in this reading. This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the new free documentation license available at www.gnu.org slash copyleft slash f d l 
www.hrs.gov.hrs.gov.hrs.gov.hrs.gov.hrs.gov.hrs.gov.hrs.gov.hrs.gov.hrs.gov.hrs.gov.hrs.gov.hrs.gov.hrs.gov.hrs.gov.